Well, it's been about a week. Here we are again. And I just figured I would give you guys a little mechanical something this time. We've been throwing a lot of electrical and droppability and engine stuff here. <clears throat> and this is engine stuff after a fashion, but it's not the normal kind of stuff you usually see. Um, so let's jump into this thing. This was a 2002 Camry that belonged to a friend of mine. And he said it always smoked on startup after you sit for a few hours. Now, whenever one smokes after you've been sitting for a few hours, then you're typically talking about valve stem seals. A lot of the times, valve stem seals will also cause it to smoke whenever it's idling. And uh, but in the, the the way it usually shows up to, to the point to where somebody's going to have something done about it is it will uh, when you first fire it up after it's been sitting, uh, there will a, a bunch of uh, all of going past the valve stem seals down there and it will get pulled in and it'll puff out smoke all over the parking lot and that kind of thing and uh, that tends to bother people. They don't typically use a lot of wall but they do make a peculiar kind of very distinctive deposit on the spark plugs uh, when the valve stem seals are leaking uh, over time. Um, that's what they look like. These uh, deposits like this, these are crusty hard deposits uh, and you're going to see that. Uh, sometimes you'll just see it on one cylinder. And your old V8 uh, Chevy 350s and stuff, they were legendary for uh, developing valve stem seal issues and all that. And uh, so we would uh, manage to go ahead and replace those. And you can typically do it uh, without pulling the head. All right. Uh, and this, I talked about these visible symptoms and all, you know, when you first started all that smoke. Uh, now, the intake valve stem has got low vacuum underneath it because that's where the, you know, naturally the, the valves closed and the throttle plates closed. There's low pressure in the intake. Uh, you don't typically have a lot of valve stem leakage problems that show up uh, on the intake valve. For, I mean, I'm sorry, the exhaust valve part of it. The intake valve is where it'll show up. It'll go past that, and it, particularly if you've got a little bit of wear on your valve guides, uh, you're going to have issues with that. But the, you know, the seals will take care of any kind of uh, leakage issue that you got because the seals get hard. Um, so um, another time that you might see a problem is if you've got the drain back holes where the oil that's pumped up into the valve cover makes its way back down into the bottom of the engine. If those are clogged up and the valve cover fills up with oil, you may wind up with you know issues for that reason too because the valve cover will fill up with oil and uh, all that. Uh, the, the seals get really hard and they crack and all that splatters around under the valve cover can make its way right past that seal and down into the combustion chambers and out the tailpipe. Now, uh, I have actually, it was a Dodge uh, Ram that had a V8 in it. It was a 91 model and heck I think it was a 360 or a 318, I can't remember. But one of the uh, things about it was this, uh, we put valve stem seals on this at the school over there. I was teaching back in the, this back in the 2000s in the aughts. And uh, the guy that was working on it, we put those, just those umbrella kind that you just slide down over there, you know. But the ones we put on there weren't really very good. I think we may have got them out of an old Felpro valve yeah, I mean, gasket set or something. But the long and the short of it was, uh, those valve stems worked their way up. I mean, those valve seals worked their way up the stem and it started having really serious valve stem cell leakage problems because they were out of place. Um, and that, um, that one was actually throwing codes uh, like there was something going on with the air fuel mixture because there was so much oil in the combustion that it was throwing the fuel trim out of kilter. And so that's, that was an interesting situation. So we had to go back in there and put some better valve stem seals in it uh, and all that. Basically what you do on that is you pressure up the uh, cylinder uh, with the, it doesn't matter where the engine is, although sometimes the engine weight may turn a little bit if you put pressure on things. But if you pressure up the cylinder with air pressure from the shop air that you're going to be working on, uh, and uh, you pull your rocker arms off and you pressure that cylinder up, then you can take the valve spring off you know, with a valve spring compressor, and they make some pretty simple little ones of those, uh, all those regular V8 engines and all. And then you replace the valve stem seal and put it all back together, 
Uh, but as long as you've got air pressure on there, some people like to take the piston and run it all the way up really close where if the valve does drop, it can't drop very far. I don't really like that. I'd rather put air pressure on it. Uh, you know, some people probably get by with that. Another way you can kind of tell, and I've seen a lot of guys doing this here in the last few years, where you can tell where the pistons are, if it's a four cylinder uh, or a straight six or something, particularly these four cylinders, just a spark plug, if you want straight in the top, they get these big old uh, huge 20 inch wire ties and they put one in each spark plug hole and then as you're turning the engine through you can see where, they are, where your uh, pistons are by uh, looking at those wire ties because they're stiff enough you know where they're going to be and that way you can tell if the cylinder you're working is on the TDC or BD, bottom dead center and where the other ones are in relation to it and if you need to turn it so that all the cylinders are halfway down so that you're not going to have any kind of an interference issue putting a timing belt on that works for that too I just keep that in mind. Um, okay. So on the other side effect uh, would be those little surges. Now, on some of the 3.8 liter Ford engines that came in the little LTDs and the Thunderbirds and stuff like that, uh, you would be driving the car and you'd begin to feel a little bit of a surge. And typically, if you unplug the EGR valve on those old cars and the surge went away, you would replace the, the IRC and IRV, that little solenoid pack that operated the uh, EGR valve that would take care of it. But there were some cases where you would have valve stem seal deposits on a couple of spark plugs and with the EGR flowing the car would surge but without it flowing it wouldn't. And that will trick you into thinking that there's problems with EGR when actually you've got valve stem seal deposits on the spark plugs. And it takes a long time for those deposits to come back. And they're not wet deposits. That oil burns off and it leaves that puffy brown stuff, you know, like I was talking about. Um, that reminds me of one time whenever the shop foreman, a guy named Philip Johnson that I worked with for a long time, I really liked that guy. He looked and talked like Slim Pickens, you know, the old actor from the old western movies. And uh, uh, I drove a, uh, when I was going to Atlanta to school, I told the service manager, uh, I said, I need a different car to drive because this silly uh, little escorts and stuff are going to get me run over in traffic up there. Because in Atlanta, when you're going 80 miles an hour, you're going to be bumper to bumper with everybody. And if you try to back off, somebody will cram another car in there between you. And so uh, he went and found me a Thunderbird to drive. And when I brought, when I came back from school, I parked it outside my service bay. Uh, it's kind of over out of the way there. And the shop foreman came over there and he said, what's that car doing sitting out there? And I said, that's that car that uh, Morris gave me to drive to uh, Atlanta. And he <laughs> A Thunderbird, and I said, yeah, well, it surged, and I had to take the EGR valve loose because it's got those valve stem seal problems. He said, that don't matter. He had good intentions. Anyway, he was ticked off because they always gave him a crappy little car to drive every time he went, and Morris gave me a nice one, or what he considered a nice one. wasn't a brand new car, but it was, you know, a nice one. Now, on the shop floor of the dealerships and independent shops where I put in all these years, we replaced valve stem seals without removing the cylinder head, and once you got the valve or rocker arm covers off, it's pretty straightforward. I talked about that a few minutes ago. Now, that's important. Opt for the really good seals. Use the best seals you can possibly get on this thing. If you can get seals like this that will fit the one you're working on, that's the ones you need to do. And I put them on the intake and the exhaust just because, you know. Now, there's a lot of, there's a whole school of thought about that, but I ain't going to go into all that stuff. Now, that was the first time I ran into this on a Toyota Camry was on a Camry. This one looks just like this one right here. I found that picture online somewhere. But the point is, my buddy, my lunch buddy had a Camry like that. And he told me, he said, uh, I get this big puff of smoke coming out when I go across the parking lot whenever I fire it up. I said, well, I know what that is. Uh, but then what happened was when I went in there considering how am I going to put the valve stem seals in there on a setup that's like this. Uh, of course, this is basically a Volkswagen that I'm showing you, but it, it works the same way. There's, it's a, a dual overhead cam on this Toyota Camry, even though there's only one gear on the outside. There's two camshafts under there, and there's a gear that uh, connects them to each other. Interestingly enough, the, 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 the camshafts that are geared together and are not chained, they spin opposite directions. Uh, I don't know if you've thought about that or not, but they do. Uh, but anyway, this... Uh, this one here, that little valve stem seal right there was going to need to be replaced. Uh, of course, you've got to take these caps off, you've got to take the camshaft off, you've got to take these cam followers out. Back in the Volkswagen days, I used to have to do valve adjustments on these all the time. That little cam follower slides up and down a polished uh, chamber in there. I mean, you know, all around that valve spring. 
and that's what actually opens the valve. It follows the camshaft and all. Um, but uh, anyway, this was what those heads looked like, and these little shims we would replace them. You know, you basically has a set of go no go gauges, and there was settings for each one of the valves, and you had a little tool that you push the follower down, and some special pliers you pull those little uh, shims out with, and you look at the reading on the shim, and you put one that's a little thicker, or a little thinner, or whatever you needed. I mean, that was the we did valve adjustments like that at a Volkswagen place routinely, just every day you do four or five, six of them. And believe it or not, in those days when I was at a Volkswagen dealer, we charged $18 to do that valve adjustment. Uh, uh, anyway, well, and that was in Sirocco's and Rabbits and this kind of thing. Um, now, when you remove the cam follower, you can see the valve spring. This is when you pull the cam follower out. Uh, the bore around the spring is so near the spring, you can't get anything in there. Your regular valve uh, tools are not going to push that down. There's going to be a little problem there. Notice this person that pulled these off marks of one and two. The Toyota dealership always pulls the head off and sends it to a machine shop. Now, uh, that's kind of, you know, more, uh, more than I thought needed to be done. All right, so I consulted the tool man. This is an AST tool. Uh, you know, you can look that company up right now. And this was a Toy 165. TOY 165 was the part number. Don't even know if you can still get these things. Uh, but that right there was supposed to work with your regular valve compressor tool. And um, I basically says, well, since we're not going to pull the head off, we need to find a way to use this on the head uh, so that we can push those springs down and get the keepers out. And we're going to air the cylinders up just like I was talking about earlier. Uh, so uh, I got that thing and I built this. I got this piece right here uh, and I ground it and ground it and worked with it so it would really snugly slide in that uh, slide in that slot right there. And then I, I got this little plate, this little three uh, quarter inch thick three by three steel plate and I just drilled all kinds of holes all kind of randomly in it. And I got this little uh, six millimeter bolt and I, th I cut that C-clamp, it was bent anyway. So it wasn't worth a dirt. I don't know how it got bent, but anyhow, I cut that thing off smooth and I drilled and I tapped six millimeter threads in there and this plate can just spin around on there. And then I, used, I welded a socket on this thing so that you could run that uh, jack screw down in there and it would give you the pressing power that you needed to push that spring down. A really usable tool. That thing's still over at the college where I used to teach somewhere. I should have patented the doggone thing. All right, so the scissor gears, though, on these Toyotas, that's a backlash handler. No, no, no it's not, but back in the, in the day, uh, whenever there were gear-driven cams um, on your uh, Chevys and some, some of your Ford, like the 2.8 liter and the old Mustang II, they had phenolic gear teeth because those were quiet. If you put metal-to-metal -metal gears, those, those gears, over time, it's going to hammer and make a lot of racket. Uh, on Volkswagen bugs, uh, those little old horizontal opposed air cool Volkswagen bug engines, uh, it would be uh, back and forth. Uh, in other words, you would have zero and then minus one, two, three, four, five, and zero plus one, two, three, four, five different angles on those. You had to set one up so that it was really snug so there was no backlash on those gears. They needed to not be too tight but they needed to not be too loose because if they were too loose they would rattle and make all manner of noise. Okay. What Toyota did was they took two gears and they put a spring in between them and they're actually loaded so they're constantly pinching. It's like a cushion effect so that uh, these two gears that I was talking about earlier, that little scissor gear, if you see that, there's a hole that you're supposed to run a bolt in through and tighten it up like that right there whenever you're taking that, these camshafts out of here because if you don't, and of course there's marks on the camshaft for putting them back in, in time but if you don't do that, when you put them back with those scissor gears loose it'll make a noise when it's running. It's really horrible. One of my students did that one time. It didn't hurt anything but it's noisy and scary. Alright, so fast forward five years. We actually did it successfully on that uh, older Camry so we said we're going to try it on a, on a newer model Camry. It's a 2002 model here. This one here was doing the same thing. It had just under 95,000 miles on it. It was puffing smoke on the startup like the older one, and it had been getting worse. And that is the actual car that we did it on. The engine has a similar valve configuration, but the camshafts are driven by a chain 
with a hydraulic tensioner, variable valve timing on the end cake camshaft, and the labor time to remove the head is an astonishing 17 hours. That is a $2,000 repair at the dealership. 17 hours labor plus the gaskets and stuff you're going to have to have. Now that head is not that difficult to pull off there. You can make you some good labor time if you have to pull a head off of one of these. The labor time, even according to your labor guide, is like 17 hours. Um, but you can do it a lot faster than that. It's not all that difficult to pull it off. When I figure where we're going to go ahead and uh, try to do these valve stem seals on this one. Interesting to me that that older one with that 2.2 had valve stem seal issues and before it even had 100,000 miles on it, it's 2.4 head valve stem seal issues. We actually did two or three of these uh, while I was over there that was this same kind of engine, same style. Um, all right, so we got the same tool, newer engine. This is the engine that was in that car there. I figured we'd drive, dive in there to see what we can do. How can, can we make this happen? All right, so with the valve cover off and the engine on number one top dead center, uh, that's zero DDC, the valve, and the tiny arrows on the bearing cap. The little bearing cap arrows are so little, you would miss them if you didn't know what you were looking for. They're little teeny tiny things. Now, this right here is the intake cam shaft. It's got that slot, I mean, that line on that, you know, the cam phaser part of it. The other one is just a flat gear, but it's got a little mark on the gear. And I'll show you that over there toward the end. All right. Now, David was working on it. He removed the common chain tensioner. That's down there. That's on the back of the head, right? It's like if you're sitting in a passenger seat, it's on the back of the engine right in front of you, pretty much. All right. So he had to pull that out of there. Big old aggravating wire harness in the way. But once you get that out of there, that's what it looks like in your hand. And you basically have to, you know, uh, work with that, you know, preload it and all that kind of stuff. All right. See that little thing right there? That's what does that. But anyway. In other words, you push it back in and lock that so that it'll hold it in while you're putting it back together. We're going to go into a lot of detail on that. Well, he removed the cam bearing caps and disengaged the camshaft from the chain by removing the exhaust camshaft bolt, removing the camshaft from the gear, and setting it on the bench. So the gear was still there, meshed in, pulled the camshaft out, laid aside, uh, had to do something similar to the other side there, you know, unchain the, that one, then you can get the other one off. It's a you know, little bit of a puzzle piece thing. All right, so with both camshafts out of the way, the cam followers lifted it out of there and placed in order on the bench. Keep those cam followers, little buckets, put those things in order so that nobody will be messing with them and you know exactly how they go back because each one of those is slightly different thickness and it's not such a huge deal, but one of the things you don't want to do is you don't want to wind up getting those things out of order because if you get them out of order, then your valve clearances won't be like they were. See, and so... Uh, uh, the fact that they built them like that, I guess they intended it to be lifetime. But anyway, uh, take those, number them with tape, do something, whatever you have to do. When you're setting those on the bench, after you pull the camshaft out, make doggone sure they stay in order because you don't want to mix them up. Um, and then, uh, simple matter to replace the garter spring valve seal. So those little valves on these Toyotas are about the size of a lawnmower, Briggs & Stratton lawnmower engine valve. The little teeniest valve, little keepers. Those little things, those stems look like they ain't about a quarter of an inch in diameter or a little, or maybe six millimeters or something. Little tiny things. That's what one of the actual valve stem seals look like. Now you're going to have to figure out a way to grab a hold of them little suckers and get them out of there. Um, you know, if you took a pair of pliers and you modify them by brazing a couple of little teeth on there, that would help you pretty good. But it's up to you how you get those things out of there because there's a little, little bit of aggravating them, get them out, but you can do it. It's doable. All right, so putting the camshafts back in, uh, in time, took some doing. Well, we tinkered with it until we got all the marks lined up. Got it all put back together, got all the cam followers put back in. See, we put, what I had him do was put grease on all those cam followers, or, well, actually, I think it was green, blue assembly lube, or green assembly lube, rather, like you use on transmissions. I just had him smear some of that on there so that they would be wet when they started spinning, you know. Of course, they probably would have been anyway. Got all the marks lined up. And see that little teeny tiny arrow? And there's another one right there. Now that one lines up with this one. And there is a mark on that gear right here that's got to line up with that one. Now we had to put it in first, put the intake camshaft in time first, and then mesh the exhaust camshaft gear with the chain. And we had to install the exhaust camshaft, settle the journals onto their saddles. Don't get those journals mixed up either. I should have said this earlier. Those little journal, those little cap, journal caps, those things have got to be laid out on the bench in exactly the order they came off. 
If they're not numbered when you pull them off the engine, you need to make sure that they're numbered and that somebody doesn't grab the shop rag they're sitting on and jerk it out from under them. Now, it's really important to keep those things in order because one size doesn't fit all. If you put the one back on in the wrong place, it may tighten up. Uh, and, you know, so that the camshaft doesn't want to turn or something like that. You don't want to go there. They may break the thing if you torque it. Keep all of that stuff in perfect order, just like you're supposed to. Now, if you don't, you're going to get in trouble. Now, that's, I put little red circles around those and all that. With the chain tensioner loaded and reinstalled and then unloaded with a long screwdriver, we're ready to uh, valve cover this baby and verify the repair. Now, that's a little look right there of the timing mark. The timing mark that you got to use here on that arrow it lines up with this one, and then that uh, on this phaser that lines up on that one. All right, so that job was a success. We conclusively proved that you could do this without pulling the head off, and it really didn't take that long to do. After you've probably done two or three of them, you could knock down some pretty heavy coins in the service bay uh, doing these things. Back whenever I was working at Lincoln uh, in the 1983 I went to work, or 84 I guess, I was working in a Lincoln dealership. Tempo Topaz had just come out. And they had that uh, high swirl combustion uh, engine as a four cylinder. It had a cast iron cylinder head, the camshaft in a block, it was like half of a V8. This thing was bulletproof. Uh, but when that thing first came out, they had problems with oil leaking down the front of the engine block because the gasket wasn't sealing good. And this was the place where the push rods went through, right? And so there was a recall on those things, or it wasn't a recall, it was a program, you know, that expires with mileage and all that, like some of these put out. And um, we were having to replace the uh, head gaskets on those things. And it paid three and a half hours to do. Um, that was the time that the program paid to do it. Well, one of the things I figured out, and the cool thing about that old dealership, it was in a big Kwanzaa hut back in those days, and there was a, there was a, uh, I mean, running all the way down, and it had a hoist on it that would roll all the way over each service bay all the way down, and it was for pulling engines and stuff like that. Well, I would disconnect the brace from the back of the head, and I would unhook, uh, pull the valve cover off, pull the push rods out, and the rocker arms off, and then I would take all the head bolts out. You know, wah, 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 pull them out with an impact wrench. You're going to torque them when you go back, but you can snatch them out with an impact wrench. It weren't hard to get to. And then, I would connect the chain hoist to that cylinder head and I would raise it up about three inches. And that gasket didn't have any glue or anything on it. It was just a glueless gasket. I don't, that's, they were clueless to put that on there. But the point is, the new gasket had this tacky blue stuff on it. The old gasket didn't have any of that. It was just a plain old head gasket. And this was a brand new engine. Now you got to remember these things all are very low miles on them. And I would slide that gasket out of there like a business card. There wasn't even any dowel dowels in there. It was just basically a, you know, gasket with a dowel-less gasket. Anyway, I would pull it out of there, and then I would feel all the way under there with my hand. I'd feel the head, and I'd feel under there on the block, make sure there was nothing on there, no bumps, there were no parts of the gasket still there. And then I would slide that new gasket under there, and I would use that chain hoist to lower that cylinder head down. And then I would zip all that stuff back together, and I would torque the head like I was supposed to and all that kind of stuff. And I'd buckle it all up, get it going. I could do that job in 45 minutes and it paid three and a half hours. I made a lot of money doing those things. But when you find a good way to do it, if you tell, if you're doing it under warranty, if you're somebody that's working at a dealer and you're dingy enough to send anything off to the dealership, I mean to the manufacturer and tell them that you can do it in 45 minutes, they'll reduce the labor time to 45 minutes to save themselves some money and cost you a bunch. Anyway, the long and the short of it is uh, there's all kinds of techniques you can develop to uh, to get work done really fast that seemed like it would take anybody else uh, a long time. Some people just work faster than others anyway. Uh, this one guy that I put in the field is working over here at a local dealer. Uh, and this uh, knothead has done so much work. Uh, he can do a lot of work really fast and not even look like he's working hard. He pulled a van into his stall one day. I just happened to be over there just visiting with him. He pulled in there on this Windstar van. And I said, what are you going to do this Windstar? He said, i got to pull the transmission out because it's got a leak in seal. I said, well, I'll just stand here and watch you. And uh, he didn't use power tools for anything except taking the uh, H-frame down. And uh, he had that transmission sitting on the bench in 40 minutes. I was looking at my watch. Uh, but the whole time I was watching him, he wasn't in a hurry. 
he didn't look like he was working all that hard. And when he got the thing on the bench, uh, it didn't take him hardly any time to get the seal put back in there and get it all buckled back up. And he put it all back together. And uh, he finished that job in like less than two hours. And that was a six hour flag. And that's where your money's made. Uh, you know, you, a lot of times you get paid for what you know how to do. And that's really important stuff. Uh, anyway, um, and I, I've worked on flag time too, so I kind of feel your pain <laughs> if you're working that way, you know. Um, but toward the end of my career, uh, you know, I, you know, you get to where you can just you know, turn out a, an awful lot of work really quick. Um, but there's one more funny little story. Uh, uh, there was about 90 hours worth of drivability work that was coming in at the Ford dealer where I was working back in the, you know, real early 90s. And um, so the service manager, we got a new service manager, and he hired another drivability guy, because I was the only one for a long time. I was having to work out 12, 15 cars a day. But he hired another guy, and that guy was a pretty good drivability guy. And that cut our my time down to about 45 hours a week. And then he hired a third guy doing drivability work, or actually had me train one that, so he could do that, which is kind of a bad thing to train people to do drivability when they can't even put brakes on. I, I, never, I never thought that was a good idea. But anyway, this guy uh, wound up we were getting 30 hours a week about that time because 90 hours was in there and there were three of us working, right? Well, the funny thing about it was there was a Windstar, a 95 Windstar that came in brand new. And that was when that car, the 95 Windstar was just, just coming out. Uh, and I said, uh, uh, the, they gave me one, they said when you use the door locks, it blows the fuse. And so, you know, it had a fob, and I got to look at And I also noticed that when you open the hatch, there was a door lock switch back here in the back. Um, but, and so I pulled all of the, you know, looking for a short, and I pulled all the, uh, the gutted the doggone thing, got all the trim out of it, looking for anything that might be pinched or have a screw running through it or something like that. And the doggone thing, uh, while I was doing all of this, there was a guy named Eddie Clark that was from Chrysler that was there that was there to look at a Jeep that somebody was having trouble with and they hadn't showed up. So he hung out with me and helped me with all of this stuff here because he was interested in this Windstar even though he worked for Chrysler. And so uh, he was a guy that was going to authorize a warranty pay on this other Jeep job or whatever. Anyway, when it was over with, I found out that what had happened with that Windstar was the goofy salesman in response to the customer's request had ordered a switch and pulled a little blind plug out, plugged the switch into the wires and put it in there. There was never supposed to be a switch there on that one because if you put a switch in there it blows the fuse. The only thing that was wrong with that was the salesman added a switch that wasn't supposed to be there and it was a factory switch. But the only reason they were going to put that switch where is if you didn't have a fob. If you had to fob, you didn't need to switch in the back in their mind. So I found out that, and so I lost about four hours worth of labor time. So then the service manager calls me and the other two drivability guys in and says, y'all aren't turning enough labor hours. Well, if there's only 90 hours worth of work, there's three of us, you know, do the math. Anyway, uh, I says, well, am I going to get paid for that four hours I burned on that Windstar that the salesman put the switch in and caused all that trouble? And he says, I don't know if you're going to get paid for that or not. You know how this crap goes. And I says, well, you know, I figured I would just throw a wrench in the works. I said, well, Eddie Clark said I was going to get paid. And he was real confused about that because he knew Eddie Clark had some authority. <laughs> and then when he finally realized what I had done to him, he yelled at me. He says, Eddie Clark works for Chrysler. And this was a Ford. Anyway, I don't know if you thought that was funny or not, but I still laugh every time I think about it. That winds up our video for today. And I hope you enjoyed the stories. And I hope we had a good time together. And I will talk to you guys next time.